Okay, I think Marika, we, I mean, think we can move on to um, the interactive panel discussion. Um, Janice Joplin comes to mind. Some key facts as well there, up there, very important. Um, and, and because I think it's really time to have um, a discussion of great social and political import. So let's start the uh, interactive panel discussion with our first question, which is to, uh, which is on it, how important are the behavioral data for cross disciplinary research on COVID 19? That we've seen this afternoon just how significant and, and so what a wide ranging impacts that COVID-19 has brought to the whole world and I think having something trustworthy because we were talking also about an infodemic around COVID-19 just how important it is to have these trusted repositories and being able to choose those publication um, the, the, the options in how widely you make that data available and we, I know from the healthcare this is a really important issue in, in terms of GDPR compliance and, and other things. So let's take the let's open the floor up to our um, researchers. Um, so I'd like to ask this first question to Anna, Julia, and Julia. So the Julia from the COVID panel in Austria and Julia from Eurodoc. So in your, could you quickly kind of talk us through from your specific viewpoints how important are the behavioural data? For cross disciplinary research on COVID 19? Yeah, so maybe I can say something from a more sociological standpoint. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so of course, the obvious contribution of behavioral data collected during the pandemic is the fact that they enable to, to do research on individuals and their interactions. So we can uh, properly describe how individuals and families reacted to the pandemic and how the pandemic affected their life outcomes. So from well-being to income, from loss of working hours to the division of domestic workforce, for example. But I also think there are several aspects uh, related to social behavior, which can be understood better thanks to the, let's say, the natural experiment of the COVID pandemic. So going beyond the descriptions of uh, the description of life during COVID, which is of course crucial, but we can also test long-standing theories and contribute to uh, extensive empirical research on many sociological issues. So in this sense, I, I think that timely behavioral data are crucial to perform informative empirical analysis. Excellent point there. Thank you, Anna. You did a great job. Congratulations on your work, by the way. Thank you. So, um, Julia, from um, what what would be your take on this question? Uh, so I never know if it's me or the other. It is you. Yes, okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, <laughs> well, I I I think I've never worked so much with people across different disciplines than in this context. So I think it this is a really unique situation where there's such a huge demand on yeah um, behavioral data from so many fields. And also the questions are sort of interdisciplinary in, in nature and also requiring sort of this um, look from different angles, be it from economic point of view or from a psychological point of view. And, and because so much is going on simultaneously. So um, I would say that with the behavioral data, we are sort of... Um, how can I say, like, like really at the intersection of everything where, you know, all sides, all disciplines want to know something about what, what is going on in the general population. And um, of course, other types of data are needed as well, like also uh, uh, special studies on specific topics. But I think with these sort of broad surveys where we cover a lot of themes in this sort of omnibus fashion, um, there is a lot of research that you know, suddenly we look into whether vaccinated people smoke more than others or, you know, like it's like things we usually would not, you know, uh, look, look at and, and, and suddenly we can link up these different kinds of things. And uh, I think completely new uh, kinds of insights have emerged from that. And um, I thought that it was um, 
uh, very interesting also for us when compiling the questionnaire to you know review the modules from different disciplines how they work how they um you know translate their concepts into questionnaires and, and such so um yeah I, I think it's extremely important i guess that's the short answer yeah i agree yeah and i think also we probably need to kind of consider also the pressures that people might have been under to go to work yeah or could there be also have been some insurance issues behind all of this which is the one of the first questions that i asked right at the beginning of the pandemic um, because I, was, I work with private industry a lot. Um, so yeah, let's move on then to the other Julia. What are you? What are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, the COVID nineteen uh, is uh, the perfect case to see how open science and different uh, disciplinary can work together uh, into uh, find the new data, new discoveries, and uh, uh, shape the policy. I think this uh, was very important to um, watch as uh, a sort of case. What we have seen uh, was the impact of uh, um, science and our research uh, in uh, citizen, uh, in different kind of uh, education, and how the reception uh, was shaping also uh, the policy and uh, uh, what the government uh, did and how it turns around. So what is important is that from uh, one side we have uh, uh, the needs to be transparent and open and on the other side uh, we have the needs uh, to protect uh, the privacy of uh, the citizen. And this is uh, also another topic uh, that uh, should be touched. So how to make uh, um, anonymous data, how to protect the privacy, how to uh, go through, uh, through the data. And uh, another discipline that uh, today we didn't uh, really uh, focus on is uh, also the law, the legislation, uh, which makes uh, the open data uh, important, but uh, also as open as possible and as close as necessary. Uh, so it's important to consider the balance when we speak uh, about open science. Yeah, and absolutely. Research. Yeah, absolutely. Also for the for the healthcare as well, and it's had a really massive impact on that. I'll pass the floor then over to you, Marie, for the next question. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering. So maybe before we move on to the next question, uh, if we could have a look at the questions that are asked by the audience. Uh, I can't see them, so I don't know. Maybe you can see them. Um, Steph see if there's anything yeah, that we should address mostly, yeah they're mostly like comments but they're really interesting ones i think we could probably collect them all i've been collecting all of the links in the chat and we all send a, a joint message in about seven days with the link to the recording as well so but there aren't really any they're more comments than than questions marie gets ah okay yeah okay, okay perfect okay so then yeah indeed let's let's move on but, to the yeah, second because question this is definitely interdisciplinary isn't it so yes, let's move on with the with the discussion. Exactly, and and I also like the the comment of Julia made uh, in terms of the legal issues. Uh, maybe this is something that we can pick up in uh, in the future uh, roadshows uh, that are to come. Uh, so thanks, Julia. That's a, that's a nice comment. Um, how did the COVID nineteen pandemic affect service providers of CESA? And I would really like to invite both Otto and uh, and Helena to uh, to to provide us some insights there. Uh, Otto, maybe you can you can kick this question off. Um, yeah, well, from my perspective, um, of course, there were challenges, um, but in result, there were negative and positive aspects. Um, first of all, as my presentation already showed, um, the pandemic caused caused uh, much new research, and that created new data, and um, that um, data that had to be archived very quickly. So we definitely had an increased workload. And now we have a new data collection, uh, which emerged in relatively short time. And one uh, product of this is that we now uh, also set up new workflows for fast track publishing. And it's possible that this could uh, get adapted for other topics than COVID as well. Um, we had to do this work uh, mostly from home office, partly with our children at home. So this, that was not easy. 
Um, but it also led to the situation that now we have implemented a perfect home office setup uh, within our institution and uh, we have implemented security checkups for home office. Our head of archive is very happy about uh, that now we have better structured and more efficient meetings. Um, because the communication became more inclusive because now uh, many of the discussions that take place um, take place in the live chat and not uh, via email. And high, the higher use of the chat allows a more natural um, flow of conversation instead of, um, uh, of long email traffic. And um, yeah, for me personally, I felt I was closer to my team in home office because um, as I told you, we have a decentralized structure and my office is in Graz and almost all of my colleagues are in Vienna. And so we were all in home office and um, we all worked together virtually independent from the um, regional location. So I felt more closer to everyone in my team. And yeah, that was my experience. And um, of course we are more trained uh, with online meeting tools. And so compared to the time before COVID, now we need less time in getting started an online meeting. Thanks, Otto. Those, those are very nice, uh, nice uh, effects uh, actually from the, the COVID nineteen. So you you really you focus on the flexibility and on really on the fast track uh, publication route, which I think is a very interesting uh, uh, new involvement. Uh, thank you, uh, Helena. Do you want to add anything to to what Otto said? Yes, thank you, Marike. I think the experiences in Finland are pretty much the same as in in Austria. But um, well, there, are, there were two points that I wanted to stress here, and uh, they are kind of more positive than negative. And um, the first one is that um, the demand for uh, data, it uh, skyrocketed last year and it, it is continuing. So there are more downloads from our data catalog than before. And, uh, this year has been even better in that sense than last year. Um, it remains to be seen how it is after pandemic, of course. Um, the second point is very much what Otto was uh, telling us. Um, the change in attitude uh, towards remote working was very swift in, in Finland and in our case. And I don't think that will uh, change even post pandemic. It's now very clear that um, most tasks can be performed remotely uh, when the network and other IT related aspects are uh, properly handled and are in place. And they, they have been very well so during this time. Um, of course, remote work has somewhat uh, affected the sense of uh, community among, among the employees in FSD. And, uh, Taking care of that, uh, you know, keeping up the group spirit will be important in the months to come after the pandemic and even even now, of course. And maybe that uh, also uh, is the same for the whole system. I mean, it's the con it's a concerted effort, and we sometimes need to meet also in person in in some place and not only virtually, but. But of course, uh, virtual meetings are are a great asset, and there are a lot of virtual meetings among the people. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. So, thank you for those insights. I think they were very important. Um, Steph, I think uh, with five minutes left uh, on the webinar, I think we uh, we could move to to our wrap up yeah, just, uh, with with yeah, the question. Can we yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. Let's do a quick round up then for all panelists this afternoon thank you very much for the excellent job that you've done what we would like to ask first to the researchers what would be your call to action to your to fellow researchers um, in the field of social sciences but also cross-disciplinary we've been talking this afternoon about the importance of psychology but also economics and other many other disciplines so one by one we'll go in alphabetical order um, by first name, just give us your very quickly your um, your 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 call for action. Thank you. Call for let me just check the panelists. 
who to go first. Ale, it's you. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, my call to action would just be, um, you know, there's a wealth of data out there and just make the most of it. Um, you know, this data has been produced. Absolutely, um, yeah. And yeah. it's out there, ready to use. Don't be afraid of using secondary data. Yeah. Use all of CESDA's great resources um, and get out there and make use of all the information that's there. Yeah, lovely. Um, so next, uh, the next, Anna, sorry, I should, yeah, Anna is next. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, in this case, I will say that publicly available COVID data, if they are collected in a rigorous way, and they usually are, can represent really a rich source of information about individual and social behavior. And as I said before, it is often possible not only to provide precise descriptive accounts of how people reacted to the pandemic, but also to know more and to inform long-standing theories and empirical research on more general topics. And of course, since this is my interest and my research, I see a lot of possibilities to study so, uh, issues of social stratification with this data. Lovely, thank you. If we could probably skip your colleagues and move on to uh, Julia. M, Julia M. Oh no, you're, you're, sorry. Um, Julia, sorry, I meant Julia P, sorry. Okay, uh, thanks. Sorry for the confusion. Um, so I, I think my call for action is actually to journal editors to speed up the publication process because uh what we are <laughs> we are putting so much effort in getting out and fast tracking the data and i feel like from my experience it's unacceptable how long it takes then to get an article published just like very a basic one that really would need to be reviewed and it, it seems like you know we put so much effort and energy in in data production and being fast and you know up to date and then the problem is that when we write our findings down, we can't find any reviewers and it takes month and month and month. And then the paper appears and the crisis has moved on and we have already 10 new waves of data. And um, I know that some journals have been doing, uh, have been working with uh, special issues and have fast tracked those. But I think on, I, I think that's no, no real solution to the problem. I think the whole publication process needs to be um, sped up as well, because otherwise all our efforts sort of get into this bottleneck at the <laughs> at the journal and we can publish preprints and such, but they don't have the same legitimacy as as a peer reviewed article. And, and when we want to go to the public, ideally, we would want already, we would like to have the feedback from the from the reviewers and already know what our peers think about it and such. And uh, currently, we are in the situation where we have all the data, we have all the knowledge, and then we wait half a year to, you know, uh, revise and resubmit. So, yeah. so that was my call for action. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's an example of how you you can't wait. There's no time for to wait, is there? You have to get it out there and and, and enable reuse as well of the data. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. So, we'll now ask the same question to the service providers. So, Helena, what would be your call to action? And I, I, I really appreciated your comment just now on the, you know, on the on this on the fact that there's a, an increased demand for data and we should be more positive than negative. So, Eleanor, what would be your call to action from today's webinar? Yes, well, um, my call for action is uh, actually, I, I would like to refer to Ricarda's uh, uh, presentation and say to everybody who is collecting data now that deposit your data to a trusted and certified data archive because data that is now fair data will be available when the next pandemic comes and it will be useful then also. So it's important to take care of the long-term preservation and usability. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Eleanor. But I think that resonates also within the healthcare sector, by the way, that they, they've said something very similar. Um, Otto, what would be your call to action? Well, and congratulations on your work, by the way. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, um, just what my call to action uh, would be: think about data sharing not 
at the end of the project, but from the first from the first step on, that um, makes work easier and for, for sharing the data. Yeah. Okay. And Ricarda, um, last but definitely not least, you you know you might want to pick up on Helena's point just now. What would be your call to action? Yeah, I think I would indeed uh, agree. And my call to action would be for everybody to get in touch with your SESTA service provider if you mm. haven't done that already or if you're not aware and see how they can support you to make your, your data available. Yeah, I agree. Um, Marie, maybe we can, we can um, connect this up with all of the very, there's been a, an awful lot of work done by SESTA on COVID-19 really early on marik maybe you would like to wrap up on the value of the having um essential points like the data catalog and the really important guide which on the on the data management expert guide which helps you know people it guides them through all of the compliance and all of the the issues that they might have to deal with especially when we're dealing with um sensitive data so marik may can maybe be you'd like to um, give us a couple of uh, pointers on that. And I, in the meantime, I can launch a couple of really quick polls and we'll just do them live while you talk us through the, um, you know, why is it important to, um, to, have, to have the data resource, as it says the resources at, on tap right across Europe. So yeah, that, this is our first, um, question though in the meantime on the poll we're asking you about the whether you've already used the SESTA data catalog for your research we understand that maybe you know you might not need um, to use it so that's also part of the the poll questions but we have we hope that we've raised a lot of awareness into its value this afternoon yeah, thanks, Steph. I think uh, yeah. I think you 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 summarized it brilliantly already. Yeah. I think uh, the calls to actions were very clear. Uh, I really want to resonate with what Ali yeah. also said. So uh, there is a wealth of data out there. We've seen some examples mm. today, uh, and the data says the catalog can help you discover that. Uh, and so uh, this is why also we're doing the 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 CESDA roadshow uh, exactly. that we link to the five global challenges, so that we can help you yeah. find and already kind of already picking back a little bit of the data sets that are mm. out there that have been reused the data there is user stories that ha we have identified but obviously yes. we're also looking for other user stories mm. so if you have used some data we uh, data sets that you found through the SESDA uh, service providers uh, in your country or through the SESDA data catalog we're really happy to uh, to connect with you and and uh, and help spread your story uh, so that other researchers become aware of the wealth of data in the data catalog, but also on what Ricarda already mentioned, um, the help that you can get from the data service providers on managing your data sets uh, and making them available, uh, not only with the data management uh, expert guide, but also uh, through uh, the, the experts in the, in the service providers. Uh, Offices. So thank you, um, Steph. I just think I think we it rests us to say uh, that we thank all of the speakers that uh, have joined us today. The tremendous work that they've put into this, uh, both the service providers from the social data archives and the researchers that joined us today. So thank you very much, and yeah. uh, and, and we invite you to join the next uh, roadshow, uh, which is the topic that we're touching upon is migration, which is also very interesting. Yeah. So with this, I think we 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 should close. Steph. Yeah, we'll just I mean, just to give them a couple of minutes to the ah, audience okay. to answer the, the question on the data management expert guide because this is all useful information. Yeah, in fact, the migration is a super interesting ratio. As are they, they these are all really really important social um, issues that we're looking at challenges um, where we will have a strong belief that the social scientists and and SESDA can really make a, um, a big difference. And I echo your words of thanks to everyone on the panel today for the great job that they've done. Um, migration also brings up other points on, on, on issues like COVID-19, for example, uh, that Yulia, Yulia P could only just put, um, touch upon, but there's a lot to discuss and to discover. 
to reshare as well. So, but yeah, thanks everybody. And I'll leave you. Let me just um, launch the results of the poll very quickly, and then we can. I'll leave you the final words, Marika, to wrap up. So there we go. Yeah. But we've increased, I think, definitely the interest and the awareness of CESDA and its uh, data catalogue and data management expert guide. So there's a lot behind that that, we, that probably not everyone in the audience is aware of. But it, it, this, I think these roadshow series will demonstrate the true value of all of this. So yeah, final words to you. Mike. I agree. No, I, I think we we uh, the the results of the polls are in, and people say that they yes they need a data management plan, uh, and but some of them don't have a, a need for it right now. Uh, so uh, a lot of people say also that's uh, very useful. Uh, so yes, that's that's very interesting. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So slides and recordings will be made available uh, in the coming days. Uh, and we'll send you a reminder mail so that you can check that yep. for that. Yep. So we hope to see some of you also in the migration uh, yep. roadshow. Thanks a yep. lot. Yeah, and and yeah, just a one, just a quick wrap up. You will get a message tomorrow on the uh, with a small announcement, but in a, a week's time you'll get another message where we will collate all of the links that have been shared in the chat this afternoon. So thank you also to our audience as well. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.